I think um, one of the difficulties in talking about um, the good life uh, and the complexities thereof um, is that at some level there's enormous similarity between ideas of good life anywhere. And at some other level, they're different, but they're not differences that are culturally divided in exactly the way uh, standard theory would tend to uh, suggest. I mean, I think if you begin with the first, I think um, Hobbes, I think, was speaking for not just uh, Englishmen, but for most people in the world when they thought that uh, nasty, brutish, and short lives are uh, not very good lives. People forget, uh, they quote those three. The fourth word was isolated, which is also very important. Now, I think, um, I don't know of any culture in the world where these values are not regarded as important. Now, we did, of course, use uh, Hobbes' uh, phrase for uh, um, divisive purposes. I was schooled, of course, in British India, and, the, and with apologies to my friend David, uh, we, of course, had some reason to foul mark the British. And I remember being the local Englishman, five foot six inches tall, who was usually described as nasty British and short, <laughs> well, well, and, and understandably isolated, uh, was quite a standard description. But the fact is that it is a uniting feature. But within that, of course, there is an enormous difference in style of expression. I, I remember being stuck. Um, I used to go to Japan quite regularly to give lectures, and I was giving a talk in mathematical economics. I was trying to prove something, and I made a mistake. I, I think I was trying to get the number, the factorial n. And instead of writing n, n plus 1 divided by 2, I wrote n, n minus 1 divided by 2. And it didn't add up at the n. And I could see that the audience was itching to say something. On the other hand, politeness prevented that. And then ultimately, somebody got up. And he said, Professor Sen, here in Japan, we think it would be n, n plus 1 divided by 2. <laughs> now, I think there's a great uh, strike for cultural relativism <laughs> that you may well be right in your country. But here, we take this particular view. Uh, my, my, my teacher, Joan Robinson, he used to have a, a cultural stereotype where he, actually you and I are both in the negative feature, he would say the Japanese are just too polite, the Indians are just too rude, the Chinese are just right. So that was uh, the, her summary of the three cultures. Uh, she was a great China fan, which was of course wonderful, uh, especially since they were quite often the Chinese were not taken seriously enough at that time. On the other hand, he also, managed, he also managed to visit China in 1961 and managed not to notice the famine that was going on and wrote a laudatory book called Notes on China at that time, which is also what happens when you are actually full of admiration and not, don't have sufficient criticality in it. But despite all the stylistic differences, there are huge similarities. That's the first point. The second point is that within any kind of thing that we describe as culture, Chinese, Indian, uh, or any other, Japanese, any of, there are enormous pluralities. And this idea that each culture speaks with one voice about the idea of a good life, I think is a great illusion. Uh, and you see that, um, I mean, Indians, of course, write extensively on any subject. And therefore, there's more Indian writing on that subject than, on, than perhaps from anywhere else. I recently said in a talk I've mentioned that there is a larger literature on atheism in India, in Sanskrit, than in any other language. But also it's true that there's a larger literature on religion in Sanskrit than in any other language. It just people write extensively. People often compare Iliad and Odyssey with Mahabharata and Ramayana, but they forgot that Mahabharata 
is seven times the size of Iliad and Odyssey put together. So if something could be six, said in six sentences rather than one, we always prefer the last, prefer the former, and therefore there's extensive writing. In 14th century, there's a guy called Matavacharya who wrote a book called Sarvadash and Sangaha, a collection of all philosophies, pretty Indian-based, 18 chapters, each chapter presenting a point of view, which is very sincerely, strongly defended, and the next chapter attacks it and presents another point of view. The first chapter is on atheism, gets a locale, gets a huge space. Second chapter is Buddhism, and it gets one thing right that Buddha certainly, in his controversies, took the atheist much more seriously than, than he took the theist of various kinds. Then comes the other things. Now, uh, the Madhavacharya, the author, actually belonged to the 18th chapter of belief. But after 17 of them had been very fairly described. And then ultimately, of course, he comes to the 18th, which, of course, wins. But it's winning where there's an enormous recognition of the plurality that exists. So if you take that view, my third point is, I think what we should compare is not so much the different views of um, good life in different cultures, but the different debates on, 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 on the good life in different cultures. And they are constantly taking place, in, even in China. I mean, you know, if the period, you're mentioning the 9th, 10th century, but, and as you mentioned, it began in the 3rd century BC, but in the period when Buddhism was spreading, the debate between the, between the Taoists and the Confucians and the Buddhists is really extraordinarily uh, strong. And, and uh, you know, uh, mixed with um, uh, prejudice, but basically enormously powerful intellectual critique of different perspectives that we see. And, and that's true of any, I mean, it's true of the Arabs, it's true of the Japanese, it's true of the uh, European, uh, actually coming even today, I mean, if we um, take the European Enlightenment, which we think of celebration of reason, which it is in, in many ways, but the divide for those of us who also happen to try to do some professional philosophy, the big division between the Hobbesian, Lockean, um, Rousseauian, including Kant, or Kant is somewhat broader than that, tradition of social contract theorizing, and a different style to which I see myself belonging, uh, you know, with, uh, with um, uh, Adam Smith and Condorcet and going further back, Voltaire, and later Marx, Mill. Uh, it's, it's, it, you know, which is mainly comparative, not looking for an ideal society and nothing else, trying to compare if there is injustice less here than there. That comparative perspective, which comes quite naturally to contemporary economists, but it's very hard to win that argument with conventional philosophers because the hold of the Hobbesian line and the Rawlsian line, because he is the inheritor of that tradition. And uh, there, the, um, uh, that division is a very big one, which of course is, uh, it, it, it's, it's to me a very good thing that it happened, that there is this division. But it also means that to think about the European Enlightenment as speaking with one voice is itself a major mistake. So I think if we are, and I'm very happy with the fact that there are these plurality, there are these debates, and we are learning from different sources and countries here and elsewhere abroad. Uh, I learned something, a lot about the uh, US legal history from President Sexton's statement, and I learned something about holding the microphone, also from him. I had got a lesson on that in an earlier occasion from a nightclub singer in, in London uh, who told me that basically what you have to do, I was being inaudible, and she said basically you have to remember that you have to try to kiss the microphone without actually kissing it. And that I think is a good, I think it's the same message as what you were trying to, to say. So I think we learn these things from all kinds of sources, some at home, some very far. And I think the great thing about humanity is that we have not resented learning from each other. 
and that applies to um, even to Chinese society, which is often thought to be very insular. And I was encouraged to say a few words about the new Nalanda all Nalanda University, which we are reviving. This is the oldest university, a Buddhist university, in fact, in the world. It's about 50 miles from what is now Patna. Uh, started in 420 AD, destroyed in an attack in 1197. And uh, it was, um, it's an Afghan attack, and the, um, uh, in which all the professors were killed and the library burned for three days. But it's interesting that, uh, as it speak, it had 10,000 students drawn from India, China, Japan, Korea, uh, Thailand, Sumatra. Um, and people came with an interest to learn from each other uh, about that. But this is also one issue where I only point Kevin where I might have some disagreement. Of, I don't know where there's a disagreement. I think the Chinese interest in Buddhism wasn't only on the ethereal aspect. I think that's a mistake. I think Buddhism also, I mean, we have a great expert in Buddhism here. But I think, you see, his entire life is concerned with worldly problems. He leaves when he sees a sign of mortality, morbidity another day and then the debilitation of old age another day, he's looking for very serious problems that affect you and me and everyone. And, in, and throughout the, his teachings, there's almost as much about these issues about, as about anything uh, beyond that. And the Nalanda University's courses it included Buddhism. It didn't include so much of God, of course, because Buddha himself was not clear on that and taking the position that you would never resolve the question. And in any case, you don't have to resolve it in order to decide uh, to behave well. And the, but the student, if you think the, uh, among the most notable students, um, well, Hewen Sang was there yeah, certainly, seventh century, was very interested in the, in, 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 with the teaching of all kinds. Yi Jing was particularly concerned about Indian medicine compared with Chinese medicine. And in fact, he wrote the first treatise on comparative medicine in China and India, seventh century. And you know, there is something uh, there which I would see uh, in terms of my general thesis, not as something very specially uh, localized, I mean, he is trying to find out what kind of thing makes people's life better, they make people live longer. Subject comes up again and again, in fact, well before him, 400, 300 years before him, Fahien had come and spent it 10 years in Patna to see what the public health distribution system at that was. So there is a kind of general interest in something that Hobbes would have recognized immediately as being important for everyone. And I, I, we were recently doing, and uh, I must finish in a minute, um, the, the, uh, we were doing some excavation close to Nalanda uh, in a place called Tilhara. There are five places where the, the university's uh, system operated there. And Tilhara, the two objects that come out, and very striking, because I went in the, when, the, when the first excavation is being completed, are two lecture halls and a student's hostel and looking incredibly contemporary from 7th century. You know, two large lecture halls with a place where you, you lecture, and presumably there are no chairs there, but presumably there's some way where they sat, and small rooms, large number of them clustered around it. Now this then, and this is the time, you know, when Bologna was established, Nalanda was 600 years old already, more than. 650 years old. Now that indicated that there is a kind of general, I mean, if you're trying to have general education to a large audience, you have to have lecture halls, you have to have students there. And the, it's not uncanny that it looks so like a modern university because it is the pattern of university teaching that determines these features. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm told that there may be couple of questions, but uh, uh, I really want to emphasize that. And actually, for the Chinese, it's a very important thing. As you know, 
uh, India being the Western Kingdom, as opposed to the Middle Kingdom, which is China, it's hard for Western Kingdom to produce anything very foundational. Nalanda happened to be the only, university, only place of higher education outside China to which any Chinese ever went for higher education. On the other hand, they did come in large numbers. And in fact, it's because of the Chinese records, which are very extensive, we know what life in Nalanda was like. Now, one point I'd readily concede that the Chinese write a hell of a lot better history than Indians do. In fact, even in China, where the number of Indian students must have outnumbered the Chinese by many factors, we, almost all the best accounts of how the university functions are Chinese. Now, I don't know that this is ultimately a cultural difference. I think the Indians ought to do better history, and in fact, they are probably trying to learn this at this time. But there are differences that may make us look as if the cultures are foundationally different. But I think these are subjects for debates and subjects for discussion, subjects for learning from each other. And so I don't really, I mean, I'm absolutely thrilled, and I take this opportunity of thanking Nicholas again, which I did in the morning also, for doing these things. I think the cultural diversities in the world are very important to recognize, but not to see them as foundational classes of values. But the history of different countries have been different. Debates have been different. Certain things have come naturally uh, as part of the debate, and other things have to come out from outside. One reason why Buddhism got such a welcome is that it was bringing a fresh thought to all kinds of places. E. Jin himself, for example, went and spent a year in Sumatra on the way, Sri Vijaya, as it was called, to learn Sanskrit. And that was a standard part of many Chinese. They would go to Sri Vijaya to learn Sanskrit in Sumatra, Indonesia, then come to, to, to Nalanda and, and study there. So I think we're thinking of something, a gigantically important uh, issue, namely global interaction of ideas. And I wouldn't settle for the, the culture, respect for cultural differences as a substitute for that. It is not.